Hello, and welcome to the Why We Argue podcast. I'm Robert Talese, your host. I'm professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University. Why We Argue is produced by Humility and Conviction in Public Life, a project based at the University of Connecticut, which explores how to balance our deepest commitments with open-mindedness, a respect for reason, and intellectual humility. The series, which is made possible by generous funding from the John Templeton Foundation, features brief discussions with publicly-minded thinkers about the state of civil discourse in contemporary democracy. Today, my guest is Nigel Warburton. Nigel holds a Ph.D. in philosophy from Cambridge and has held academic positions at the University of Nottingham and the Open University. Today, he's a freelance public philosopher in the fullest sense. He's offered philosophy courses at the Tate Modern Gallery, and he conducts monthly philosophical discussions at Blackwell's Bookshop in Oxford. He also co-hosts with David Edmonds the wildly popular podcast series Philosophy Bites. His philosophical interests include philosophy of art, especially the philosophy of photography and architecture, as well as ethics and political philosophy. Nigel is the author of several books, including The Art Question, A Little History of Philosophy, and Free Speech, A Very Short Introduction. Hello, Nigel. Hi, Bob. How are you today? Uh, Fine, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks for joining me for uh, the Why We Argue podcast. Pleasure. So, Nigel, um, in both of our countries, uh, it seems to me, and I'm sad to say, um, there seems to have been embraced a mode of political engagement that rewards confident assertion and hostile accusation. Snap judgment is taken uh, to reflect or to be a signal of moral clarity and firm commitment. The admission that issues are difficult or even complicated or puzzling is taken in many contexts to signal political weakness. Um, Meanwhile, um, vast power is being wielded in ways that impact the lives of millions of people. Um, What do you make of our current political environment in this respect? Um, I'm disappointed, obviously, (laughs) uh, the way things are going. But it seems to me this is just more rhetoric, rhetoric has been around since ancient Greece, at least, and um, people have persuaded other people not just by the power of their argument, but by emotional devices, by the way they look, by the passion in their voice and so on. Those things have always been important in politics. It's not as if we're seeing something radically new there. I think what's new is that people are being so openly anti-intellectual, opposed to expertise, um, they're, they think they can refute things by repudiating them, which is a da- really dangerous um, way that we're heading, where people think that simply by denying things, that makes them untrue without the need for providing any evidence or argument. And that is a completely against the spirit of philosophy and where I'm coming from. But it's not new in politics. I think it's just um, a new degree that we're seeing here, a new brazen challenging of the status quo. Do you think that's a, an interesting point? And I think you're quite right that there's what looks to philosophers uh, like you and me, um, like a conflation of refutation with repudiation. Um, but um, I wonder if uh, that isn't a rather direct consequence of maybe a different kind of error, which is the error of well, what we would think of an error, as an error of thinking that any potential source of evidence or reason, um, uh, any argument that one might pose is already polluted in some way by an oppositional political agenda or that sort of the facts themselves, whenever they're pointed to, is already um, – um, uh, sort of saturated with with somebody's political perspective. I'm not sure it's as complex as that. I think it's there are a number of people who want power, and the way they can exercise power is by drawing the popular vote in their direction, and they'll do that by any means they can. I'm not sure it's it's as sophisticated as the kind of philosophical. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking that um, in the States, at least, um, there's so much um, 
public discourse devoted to bias, what, what is posed as bias detection um, among news outlets. Even the president uses the term fake news, uh, as he used it yesterday, to describe any reportage that looks um, uncomfortable from his political or to his political um, uh, agenda. Um, that it, it, it seems as if... Uh, um, the way the rhetoric is being wielded, and I take your point about rhetoric just fine. I mean, I think you're, you're completely right. Neither is uh, this a new worry um, uh, or unfamiliar. Um, but uh, the, the, I guess the, the, the worry is that um, the anti-intellectualism has a kind of bite to it, that there's no honest intellectual opposition to um, – uh, to a particular, to the, to a speaker's particular perspective. And that's the reason why, um, intellectual engagement is to be avoided because there's, there, there there's nobody who's intellectually worthy interlocutor. But all of us have biases and all the psychological evidence is pointing towards the fact that we have many more biases of more extreme kinds than we'd imagined before, uh, whether they're racial biases or biases towards the kind of evidence that will confirm our deepest held beliefs. And, and I think um, what we're seeing with some people in powerful positions is an exaggerated form of confirmation bias. There's a sense in which whenever they get one voice that supports them, they focus the beam of the media as much as they possibly can on the supporting voice, the one that tells them that, yes, there's no such thing as climate change, or yes, um, a certain kind of military action will devastate a, um, a, an opponent. And they exclude the other voices. So I agree with you there. So there's a kind of, look, that's the right, what, that's the right answer. Somebody there has seen the answer. And this beam doesn't allow for um, a conversation. Now, obviously, as philosophers, we come from a tradition where you air your views, you entertain views, you almost seek challenges to your views. And this is something John Stuart Mill was uh, brilliant on, that we actually look for dissenting voices. We look for the, the weaknesses in our argument. We test them to destruction. So as a philosopher, it's a matter of honour almost that you engage with the critical voices that oppose the thing that you're saying, even though you believe what you're saying if you're a sincere philosopher. Um, so um, there's that tradition, and this is something quite different. This is the, uh, the, the unashamed um, narrowing of attention just to those people who tell you what you want to hear. It's a kind of exaggerated wishful thinking where the politician stands up and says, oh, yes, um, John over there is saying what I want to hear. Let's put him in a senior position and... Uh, Jolly good. And everybody else, just be quiet. Just, you, you know, you're, you're not pulling together for the country. Um, so that's completely against the spirit of conversation that philosophy was born in, through Socrates particularly, though Socrates um, steered his conversations quite dramatically um, <laughs> for his own benefit, at least if we believe Plato. Um, but, but the ideal of philosophy, I think, is where you have um, somebody putting forward a case and then that person seeking... Um, engagement with argument so that the, con the kind of collision of, of different positions allows you to refine your argument and, and to, to pull the resources of intelligent people around you so life as a kind of seminar <laughs> rather than life as um, um, appointing a henchman who will say yes to you, whatever absurd view um, you put there. So you, some, I believe some companies... Um, actually appoint philosophers as, as devil's advocates in their company so that they get um, a, a range of views um, <laughs> discussed. And that, that seems to me the great thing about philosophy, that we, we value being challenged. And it's, it's, it, from outside it can seem quite, um, uh, quite like a, a, a kind of intellectual combat, but if it's done in the right spirit... There's a sense of engaging critically with people's arguments. So you're thinking rather than parroting views. Um, your, your views are held as living views, not just, not just um, dogma, or as, as um, Mill put it, dead dogma. Right. The thing that we strive against is dead dogma, dogma that is just held, beliefs that are held and unchallenged. So in a sense, um, someone like Trump challenging the status quo 
the scientific status quo, the sci- scientific consensus on climate change could be quite a good thing as a challenge. But as a as somebody with political power, it's terrifying because having challenged that, he's not listening to the brilliant arguments that come back at him and the piles of data and and um, terrifying um, direction that we're moving in in terms of um, the environment. He's just not prepared to hear once he's engaged with the argument. But the actual act of dissenting is something which I think we should celebrate. I mean, I think the the person who's prepared to put their neck on the line and say, no, hang on, I'm not sure you're right there, is a very very valuable part of a democracy. I mean, if, if we're all saying yes, then we can be blind to the arguments on the other side. Um, and even if we aren't blind to the arguments on the other side, we might not have considered deeply why we believe what we believe. Right. One of the, I think, very um, uh, astute observations uh, that Mill makes uh, in the in the part of um, the, the the treatise on liberty that we uh, were just indirectly and then directly discussing is th- about the dead dogma. Dead the, dead dogmatism is a problem, even if the dogma is the truth, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Even if you've got, even if you're correct in what you hold dogmatically, that it's held dogmatically. That is. Um, that you uh, hold your belief um, without having considered or with, without um, having knowledge of um, what the case what case can be made on the other side, what intelligent critics might say, what people who want to see not the f- the full on rejection of the the truth, but just the revision of it in some w- w- direction or other, that you can't sort of navigate the dialectical sort of considerations to and uh, you know for and against uh, the view. That itself is a kind of um, intellectual failure. Yeah, we see prejudices can be true, as you point out. Prejudices can be true, but as a philosopher, certainly, and I'd hope as a citizen, you don't just want to believe things that are true. You want to believe them for the right reasons, um, for good reasons, um, not just because your parents told you these things are true or because somebody in a position of power over you forced you to thinking along those lines, you want to consider them for yourself. This is, going back to Socrates, um, the idea that um, it, um, the unexamined life isn't worth living, you know, there's the sense in which we only get one life, we get a chance to think th- things through a bit for ourselves. It's quite difficult because we've got all the, the baggage of the previous generation, we've got the our schooling and upbringing which influences dramatically, but as we become adults, we we get a little bit of uh, leverage and start to question things and I mean it obviously starts very early on in for children as well you start to question things you're told and you it, my ideal of education in philosophy is that you equip people to think for themselves you don't equip them simply to to repeat what they've been told but to think is that true what are the reasons it's how are the good counter arguments how do I weigh these against other ar- arguments and you, the, the, the model is that you have um, philosophical skills of, of reasoning and argument that can adapt to a wide range of situations. I'm not saying it's a panacea. I don't think it cures everything. I think uh, philosophers are prone to um, rearranging their prejudices as much as um, <laughs> almost any other kind of intellectual. And from outside, they can look as ridiculous. But in, uh, the hope is that we can get enough leverage to think a little bit for ourselves and not just be in the um, dogmatic mode um, and not just um, parroting arguments that we've heard, but actually thinking for ourselves. Now, not every citizen is, is going to devote themselves to studying philosophy, studying those skills, engaging in that way. But I think that most people strive to think for themselves to some degree and most people think that they are reasonably well equipped to make up their minds on some big issues. Um, in a way, that maybe that's led to this kind of scepticism about ex- expertise, because on you can on the internet you can become an instant expert on almost anything. And there's a feeling that we don't need an expert to sift the evidence, because I can sift the evidence that's out there. And the danger there is that we don't know how reliable the evidence, so-called is that we find on the internet there's a huge problem if I as a um, a googling um, individual um, 
decide that I've, I've found the right answer somewhere if I'm not sufficiently subtle about the way I analyse the sources because there are lots of um, disreputable sources for um, ideas out there. There are lots of people purporting to be authorities which you know when they're they're charlatans and and discriminating between those is is part of what um an expert does right and i i guess that there's a, a sort of um uh a, a closely related danger about the 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 the, the self-made expert with uh with google searching um in that uh one can come away from even a, a, a pretty um, sincere and competent effort to find something out online uh, with, a, with an inflated sense of the degree of confirmation that some piece of evidence might enjoy because Google sources sometimes rely on each other for their evidence. <laughs> and so you can have two or three different sources um, – uh, independently affirming some view, and what you might not know is that three of those sources are depending on the fourth, all f- for their source. And so you come away with the idea, oh, th- I've got four independent con- confirmations of this piece of information, when in fact you don't, because you you don't know that three of your sources were just repeating what they saw on one of the sites that you've already looked at, <laughs> right? You're going to get this false sense of confirmation. So it's, it's not, not an easy situation, and I'm not saying um, that there's any simple way out of that. Uh, I do think part of education now has to be education about sources. Right. I do think that's, that's vital, and I don't think that, in my experience, philosophy departments do enough of that, actually, in the education of philosophy students about reliable sources for information on the, on the Internet, because we know that most students, given an assignment, go straight to to their iPads or, or um, laptops and start looking for shortcuts to the answer to the question you've set them. Um, you know, often they're, often they're, in that's class. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's good in a way, you see, but it's, if it's done in the right way, it's amazing um, that somebody can very easily get access to, to ideas and primary texts and all kinds of resources, but... But you need to discriminate between the resources, and that's that's not straightforward because uh, if I say, oh, such and such a uh, resource is a reliable one, um, somebody who doesn't hold the same kind of political view as me might say, well, that's absurd. That's just a biased, uh, that's a highly biased, politically biased source you're using. You ought to go back to this source, which is much better. Um, and, and then it's very difficult to persuade either party that they've got the right um the right, the right source on the internet. Right. Um, so this is, it's complicated. I mean, I can understand why, how people's views get amplified by the confirmation they find when they search for things. It's all about searching. The key word that you put in defines your search, and the algorithm comes back with um, a bigger version of the thing that you were looking for. You know, it expands on the idea that you were looking for. So if you're already looking for things from a particular angle, you're going to find more and more of that and feel more and more confident. Um, and and uh, sadly, confidence isn't highly correlated with truth. Um, <laughs> we know about the Dunning-Kruger effect and how some yeah. of the people are most confident in their views are the, are the least reliable, um, which is terrifying. And, you know, we talk about the best, like all conviction, but and the, 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 that's what it feels like today, that, um, that people who are sure, so sure, so absolutely sure that they're right um, on every, of every political persuasion, seems to me they're the ones we should be cautious about um, because they're not engaging in that sort of Dialogue which allows them to modify their view in any, any way. They, they're almost blinkered in the way that they approach any issue. Now, it's very difficult to be open-minded. Um, I mean, I'm not suggesting that's, that's going to happen either, but, but there is a kind of terrifying um, passion that some politicians exhibit, right. which right. Sort of indicates they, can't, they know they can't be wrong. They, it's a fervour that they speak from. And that, again, I think is against the spirit of philosophy, personally, and I, I see it in philosophers as well. Um, 
un, an unwillingness to debate that they already know the answer so why would they want to engage in conversation whereas for me philosophy is all about conversation it's about the conversation it's not about the end result as much as anything because most of us are going to die before we work out whether there are actually objective moral values or not whether um there's any truth in in relativism there, there are all kinds of big questions in philosophy that aren't going to be resolved before we die we're going to have to live with um, an ongoing debate about things um and people some philosophers act in the world as if um they're confident that they've discovered the way things are and it's all settled and they can just um get on with it whereas it strikes me that um philosophy is an ongoing act, uh, activity and its questions will never be fully answered what we hope we can do is refine answers and eliminate some absurd um directions that we can take and there's, a, there's obviously an amazing accumulation of the history of ideas of the kind of cultural accumulation that allows us to think better today than people could i reckon a few hundred years ago because we have much more many more great thinkers works to access as a result of the book and now the internet and so on but it doesn't mean that we we we're, we're going to reach the end of philosophy that we're going to resolve everything i think the kinds of problems that philosophy deals with about morality politics the nature of reality are so complex and 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 difficult to come to an end decision on that that we're all going to die before <laughs> before they're solved um sadly so now let me <laughs> Let me ask um just a question going back to Socrates um because um one of the uh interesting I don't know if if irony is the right word but one of the interesting features of Socrates is that um he, we at once hold him up as a um uh, as an ideal of the inquiring mind and the 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 the, the, the seeker the, the 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 person who's questing after truth the 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 model of philosophical inquiry we uphold him um in all of these in all of these ways and uh, uh which i endorse um but he also was really um uh famously at least as plato depicts him um socrates was also very um wary um of democracy Yeah, democracy uh, right. for him wasn't quite the same as democracy for us, but certainly he felt that um allowing people to vote for a leader was a risky strategy because he felt that it's much better to have somebody put in place who's a good who's good at being a leader rather than let the rabble choose as it were even though right. the citizens weren't exactly rabble. So in his analogy if um you're in a ship at sea and there's a storm and the captain falls overboard you don't have a vote on which way to steer the ship you you find out pretty quickly if somebody else knows how to steer a ship um and put them in charge yeah. um you it, voting is is an unreliable way of getting the best person into that sort of position um well you know might say we've got plenty of evidence of that in in the last year um <laughs> Plato wasn't so stupid was he but um for so, me that's not the role of democracy the the role of democracy is having the ability to get people out that's a crucial thing uh, democracy allows at intervals for uh, uh, democracy allows at intervals for people to um eliminate the sitting um powerful person <laughs> um as opposed to tyranny where you're stuck with them for as long as they want to be stuck there Right, right. So, Nigel, um you've been very generous with your time. Um I wanted to make sure we got to sort of a one one final question. Um so you, you have a very um and you've articulated even uh, in 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 the short while we've been talking a very I think attractive conception of um philosophy and um the way that uh um conversation about politics and can other kinds of uh hotly contested um uh, uh issues that that confront us individually and collectively ought to be conducted um do you have any um advice or any takeaways from the the current political um turns in either of our countries that might um help citizens try to 
um, sort of recapture or, or better um, practice um, the kind of conversation and inquiry that you've been um, uh, talking about and recommending? <laughs> I'm not sure that the role of a philosopher is to give advice. I think some do that, and I'm always wary of the kind of guru tendency uh, or the um, agony aunt tendency in some cases of, ph- of philosophers in the popular uh, media. Um, I think philosophy is all about thinking for yourself. So if I had any advice at all, I guess my advice is to think for yourself, but people will do that anyway. They're not going to take my advice. And if you think for yourself, because I've told you, you're doing it for the wrong <laughs> reason anyway. So basically, um, on some, day, uh, some days I wake up and I think we're just in a terrible situation and I can't see any way out. And there are some analogies with what was happening in Europe in the 30s. And I just hope the analogies don't continue in the same direction as they did then. Um, but just as then, very clever people talking about what was going on didn't stop it happening. I'm not absolutely convinced that argument and reason debate is going to stop powerful people from doing evil things. So um, I guess my only advice is to watch out for people doing evil things and do everything you possibly can to stop them. But that might not be debating with them. There may be, you know, the power of the law might be needed, um, uh, civil disobedience, whatever. But it, I'm not absolutely sure that reason debate will do more than comment on what's happening and articulate uh, and communicate the terrible things that are happening. Well, Nigel Warburton, um, thank you so much uh, for joining me today on uh, why, the Why We Argue podcast. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you, Bob. It's great to talk to you too. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Why We Argue podcast, which I remind you is produced by the University of Connecticut's Humility and Conviction in Public Life Project with generous support from the John Templeton Foundation. You can follow the project on Twitter and on Facebook at, at Public Humility. That's one word, Public Humility. Thank you so much, and bye for now.